Our first speaker is Chris Cox. Chris Cox is a Philadelphia art area abstract artist. She has been represented for the last five years by Bluestone Fine Art Gallery in Old City, Philadelphia. Last year, Chris was selected to be the featured artist for Bluestone at the inaugural Philadelphia Fine Art Fair. And this year, she is one of the seven artists featured by Bluestone in the Hamptons Virtual Art Fair. And recently, Chris had two paintings selected for Woodmere Art Museum's 79th annual juried exhibition to be held in the spring of 2021. In 2018, she had three paintings selected for one of the movie sets for this film, Creed II. Her work was also in the Art of the State 2015, an invitational exhibition at the Art Association of Harrisburg. Additionally, you can also see her work in inliquid.com and artsy.net. Chris paint, Chris's paintings are in a private collections in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, Michigan, Alaska, and Rhode Island. Please give me a warm, please let's give our guest a warm welcome, Chris Cox. Hi. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Abington Art Center for uh, selecting my paintings and sculptures to be part of the fall solo series. Sorry, Chris, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Here we go. All right. Well, good morning again, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Abington Art Center for selecting my paintings and sculptures to be part of the fall um, solo series exhibition and for giving me this opportunity uh, to present the artist talk. I would also like to thank all of you for joining me this morning. I thought I would talk about four things in this artist talk. The inspiration for these paintings and sculptures, my process in creating them, the finished work, and what I hope you as the viewer sees in them. When I get to the part in the talk about the, uh, the work in this exhibition, I will show a PowerPoint of the paintings and sculptures. And that will be up in the screen. But for now, I'll, uh, you'll just need to look at me talking and um, just keep in mind that I am an artist, not a public speaker, so be kind. Hopefully I'll, I'll make it interesting for you and you know, looking at me won't be too painful. As for questions, perhaps you can jot down your questions and uh, we'll leave time at the end to answer any of them. And I think Gina said something about putting them uh, you know, on the chat um, you know, that you could do that also. But, um, you know, I, I'd like to maybe hold those to the end if, if we could do that. So um, let's get started. Let's start with the inspiration. Uh, the world-renowned architect Frank Gehry said, you can look anywhere and find inspiration. And they tell us as artists, we have to always evolve with our art and discover new ways to communicate and all of our ideas and our art. And that it's important to look everywhere and to use whatever is interesting that we see or experience. The British sculptors, Tim Noble and Sue Webster, talk about an artist's brain being like a giant creative sponge that draws on every single experience, many of which seem meaningless to others. I happen to find inspiration in old stone walls and paint what I see in them. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to be in Paris and I found myself down on my knees on a street corner, looking at the carbon buildup of an eroding foundation of an old stone building. It was beautiful. Several colors of blue and rust and, and black and black on top of a grayish putty stone. As I looked closer, I, I could see something emerging. It was an abstract atmosphere. Later on, during that same trip, I was out in the French countryside, and I was totally in intrigued with what I saw on the crumbling old stone bridge there. It was pocked with green, yellow, white lichen, and upon closer observation, I could see an abstract landscape emerging from that. And then during a trip to Italy, we stopped in Pompeii. I was amazed not only by the fading frescoes on the walls, but also by the images that the volcanic residue had left behind. 
To me, it looked like a turbulent seascape. So whenever I've had the, the opportunity and the good fortune to travel, I look for things in old stone walls, an abstract landscape, an atmosphere, other worlds. So it came as no surprise to me that when I was in Egypt early last year, I was taken with the imagery on the stones as we navigated through the locks on the Nile. The haunting figures that the river's water had stained onto the walls of the locks were mysterious, yet had a certain spirituality and peacefulness. I felt it was like a sense of otherworldliness to them. And, and these were truly water stains. No one had drawn on the walls or anything like that. William Burroughs, um, the Beat Generation writer and artist, said, nothing exists until or unless it is observed. An artist is making something exist by observing it. As artists, we are always searching for new ways of doing art and trying to see things in different ways. According to Rod Jenkins, the author of The Art of Creative Thinking, it can be as simple as seizing on a, something that's been overlooked by the world and forcing the world to take notice. Sort of like discovering hidden worlds through your art. And they say it's easier to discover a world than to make one. And maybe that's what I did with this, this uh, series. Now let me discuss my process. I work oil on canvas and oil and cold wax on board using primarily oil sticks and which they say is a less tox toxic option for artists. I don't know, but perhaps. Um, I use very few brushes. I prefer palette knives, scrapers, squeegees, rags, um, sponges, anything that will give me the texture and the surface that I'm looking for in a painting. I usually lay my foundation with a roughly applied ground and build from there, adding layers upon layers <laughs> until it develops a rich history. Sometimes there can be as many as 10 layers until I arrive with, at what is the final composition. And I, I think this is an, unlike how a lot of artists work too. Um, sometimes there could be as many as 10 layers and you know, each could be a painting in its own right. It's all about process for me. I, embrace, I really do embrace the unexpected and allow the process to reveal or uncover what is there. That's when the painting, in my opinion, becomes what it wants to be. I don't plan a painting. Many um, artists, myself included, say that the work seems to make itself. Um, and the artist serves only as the guide or the mediator, allowing anything to be possible. And I, I really do believe that. Because I think sometimes when you try to force something, eh, it doesn't work. The philosopher Plato maintained that art is a gift from the gods channeled through the artist. Who knows, but it's an interesting thought. Abstract contemporary artist, Pat Steer, who does the monumental drip paintings that you might be familiar with, says she liberated herself from decisions about imagery and lets the record of the process become the image itself. She also feels that layering in her work like I do in my paintings, gives it depth and heart. And I like that idea. Also talking about process, the Polish painter Wilhelm Zasnell said, there are no rules. He thinks of painting as being like when you slide down a mountain on a snowboard. You don't know what's coming along the way. And I couldn't agree more. And, and even the musician Herb Alpert said about his music, I, I just react to what sounds good and try to stay as spontaneous as possible. Mostly I try to be honest and listen to my own voice. I think that is true for painting too. The bottom line is you can't think too much about it. And so many times, you know, <laughs> so many times you think you know where you're going with the painting and then it takes you someplace else. Then what do you do? A mentor of mine, artist Ryan Earl, said to me at one time when I was struggling with a painting, he said, at what point do you abandon intention and embrace discovery? I love that thought. And I think as artists, we're all, you know, constantly faced with that quandary. Agnes Martin, the great artist, said, the main thing in making art often is letting go of your expectations. 
and, and your ideas. So true. They say most advances in anything are the product of discovery, not premeditation. The other, th the other question I think as artists that we all struggle with is um, when is a painting done? According to da Vinci, art is never finished, only abandoned. I never finish a painting, said the artist Corky. I just stopped working on it for a while. And artist Francis Bacon's paintings were often titled studies because he was unable to decide whether or not they were finished. But the real question for me is, and has always been, how do you know if you've gone too far or not far enough with the painting? That, in my opinion, determines where you stop and back away from the canvas. Okay, so let's talk about my work in this exhibition now that I've given you this lead up. Um, I'm going to put a PowerPoint of my paintings and sculptures up on the screen, but first, the, the ones that are in this exhibition at, at Abington Art Center. But first, let me give you a little bit of introduction to the work. The paintings and sculptures I've created in this series tell a story, a story of spiritual beings, poetic figures that exist in another world. They began as still lifeless beings. As the series progressed, they freely move around and interact with one another. I think their story is one of peacefulness, spirituality, community, togetherness, and individuality. I have eight paintings and four sculptures that are part of my series that I call Spiritual Journey, A Visual Narrative. As I previously said, the, the uh, work was inspired by what I saw on the stone walls as we passed through the locks on the Nile in Egypt. Now I'm going to put the PowerPoint of the paintings up on the screen so that we can talk better about these. Let me just make them bigger. Okay. All right. The, um, the first painting I did in this series is the one called Standing Still. The beings appear to be lifeless, almost pillars of wood. I consider the atmosphere in this painting to be the most important part. It's almost surreal. And this is one of the ones from this series that will be in the, there are two that were going to be in the Woodmere Art Museum annual show. This is one of them. And this is the second one that will be in the, the Woodmere annual in the spring. Um, this one, Weathering the Storm, is the second painting I did. And this is, um, you know, just so that you know, this one, this painting is cold um, oil and cold wax on board. There's two in this series that are oil and cold wax on board and um, the rest are uh, oil on canvas. In this painting, the beings become a little more lifelike as you can see, but sort of frozen in time. I think the atmosphere and the setting are also very important to creating the mood in this painting. To the next one. In this painting, Free Spirits, it's as if the beings have begun a journey together, maybe going towards a promised land or fleeing from something. And this is another one where the background, I think is, I mean, is, they're very diminished by what is happening in the background too. I mean, they, you know, they, they have a, um, a sense that the, there's something bigger than they are. Now this is another one that's um, oil and cold wax on board. And in this painting, distant shores, they seem to have arrived somewhere and, you know, or perhaps chatting or going about their daily life. And in crossing paths, they appear to have developed somewhat of a sense of community and togetherness. The same is true for this next painting, moving into the uh, light. And the, the, um, the background, you know, is um, taken from the previous painting, as you can see. I'll just do that 
as you can see, it's just a more of a close up type of um, atmosphere there. And then in night meeting, they seem a little disturbed and unsettled about something. Even the sky pretends something ominous. And, um, you know, there, there seems to be one person that is more central in the, the figures there that, uh, uh, among the figures, that has a little bit more power than the rest. And, um, and finally, in the painting Watching, we see perhaps there is an unknown but outside looming threat. Maybe even something cataclysmic or catastrophic has happened. And um, even the colors used in this and the size of the beings sort of give us an uneasy feeling. As you can see, as I've gone through these paintings, I, I worked with a limited color palette. In the beginning of the series, uh, in the beginning of the series, the paintings were very monochromatic and color really only comes into it in the last two paintings, but I think it, it adds drama. Whereas the monochromatic part of the others maybe gave it a little more peacefulness. Now, let, let me say a few words about um, the sculptures in this series. These were done after the paintings. I, I felt a need to do something more three-dimensional. I thought it was the logical next step. And uh, so I began searching for how I could achieve what was in my mind. And, and that's when I came across cypress knees. <laughs> they, cypress knees are woody projections from the roots of cypress trees. And they're vertically sent above ground, above water level, not ground, above water level, because um, you know, they're usually in swampy areas. And their function is unknown. They really don't know why the cypress trees do this. And each of the cypress knees has their own distinctive shape and size. I was able to get nine cypress knees from a mother and daughter home business in Georgia. They sent me random shapes and sizes. I didn't get to pick anything out. When the cypress knees arrived, they were covered, really covered with dirt and moss. And then my work began, cleaning and carving and painting and mounting. And once I saw who they had become, I started putting them together in um, ways that I thought worked. Soulmates, as you see here, became a grouping of three who looked like a family to me. And um, kindred spirits became a group of five. You, you probably can only see three with this particular photo, but there, believe me, there are two others that are smaller. And um, so the two, three larger and two smaller. And I thought of these, like maybe they are friends or collaborators or community leaders. And while working on Kindred Spirits, I couldn't help thinking of Rodin's The Burgers of Calais. Um, let me go to the next one here. Um, the sculpture, When the Spirit Moves, as you can see, is someone on the move. Uh, you can almost feel a sense of purpose as he or she forges forward. And um, finally, the six-foot fabric sculpture, Spirit Guide, was created because a fellow artist challenged me to do something more life-size. And it indeed was a challenge to come up with the armature and then cover it and make it part of the family of sculptures. But my biggest challenge was to make it seem non-threatening and more spiritual. I, I hope I have achieved that. And um, now, now I'd like to show a, a short 30 second video clip of how all of these paintings and sculptures look in the exhibition at um, at, at Abington Art Center. So let me see if I can make this happen. Okay, here we go.
Kim. Well, I, in, I'd like to say I, I'm still searching for why I've created these paintings and, and sculptures and what they mean. A dear friend of mine who passed away while I was working on um, this series said to me, eventually the meaning will become clear. Okay, still waiting. In the meantime, what I do know is that these paintings and sculptures and spiritual journey, a, a visual narrative are peaceful and otherworldly with a sense of mystery. So finally, let me just say a few words about hope, how I hope that you connect with my work. And maybe I'll go back to me just talking here and then if we need to, okay. So um, art is not what you see, but what you make others see, said Degas. Yes, art is so personal. Everyone sees something different. And that's even more true when the work is abstract or surreal. Creativity is magic. Don't examine it too closely, said the playwright Edward Albee. Something to think about. According to Kit White, the author of 101 Things to Learn in Art School, good art never stops revealing itself. Images should reveal their secrets slowly. And the more complex the image, the slower the revelation. Artist Philip Guston said regarding his paintings that he wanted to end with something that would baffle him for some time. I think that's also what I want my work to do. They say if a piece is to have significance for anyone other than the art artist, it needs to have something that will retain the viewer's attention, draw them in, keep them looking and generate an emotional response. Years ago, I had taken a class with Stuart Shields, a Philadelphia artist who teaches at uh, PAFA. He encouraged us to look at paintings with our senses. He said, you don't eat dessert with your intellect. I think that's good advice. And I guess in some ways, everyone wants to find something familiar in the painting, the find the bunny moment, as they say. They're looking for a familiar sense of place or an object or a person. But what really draws us in, Philadelphia artist and teacher Kasim Moody says, is what we just can't quite put our finger on, the mysterious. Another Philadelphia artist and teacher, Val Rossman says, a painting should ask more questions than it answers, which I think is a very interesting way to evaluate a painting. And I feel this series does just that. It asks more questions than it answers, because I'm still looking for those answers. So um, with my work, I hope you, the viewer, feels a um, emotional connection to my paintings. As the German artist Gerhard Richter said, Art is the ideal medium for making contact with the transcendental, or at least getting close to it. Bottom line, I, I want you to feel like you can walk into and through my paintings and have a never ending journey. Thank you for joining my artist talk this morning and listening to what I had to say, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for that lovely presentation. Does anybody have any questions for Chris, now is the time. I will make it so you can um, unmute yourselves. You can ask in the chat additionally. I have a question from Larry and Rosanna. Uh, can you tell us about the cold wax that you use? Okay, well, cold wax is a medium that um, you can mix in with um, oil and um, yeah, and you can put all kinds of things into the cold wax. I mean, you can put ashes, you can put dirt, you can put whatever uh, in with the cold wax and the oil and what, you know, whatever you use. Um, I don't think you can use the cold wax with acrylics. I think it's only oil. And it has a very, it's not like encaustic because encaustic can melt, but cold wax, I mean, it has a real high melt uh, point like 200 degrees or something like that and um, it's just a, a wonderful it gives you a different effect in, in things so you know it's I, I've done many uh, abstract landscapes in the uh, in the cold wax but you basically have to work on board you can't work on canvas because it'll crack but so it's all, always a working on board I think some people do use canvas but that you have that problem you can have that problem Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I have another question in the chat from Tina. She says, beautiful work, Chris. 
curious about your use of white. A lot of artists have views about white. Did you start with the idea of white or how did you get there? Hmm. I'm trying to think of uh, when I first started this, you know, the first painting that I did, there, white was in a, a, well, here's the thing. I usually do a ground that involves, you know, putting white on top of the canvas, not just the, the gesso that's already there, but other white. And um, I think I, 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 that, that first painting, you know, the white was pro predominant and lots of grays and whatever. And with these black figures, with these dark beings, the white just, you know, makes them pop. But I mean, you, they look different on, on color, in color. Um, the other thing is, is it, with white, it gives, it, it has a, a coldness to it. And I think I wanted them to be in a cold atmosphere. And, um, you know, maybe that was it. Okay, great. Um, I have a comment from Jackie in the chat. She says, your work brings life to the quote, things are known by their opposites, dark and light, disturbing and calming. Hmm. Very good, yeah. I mean, that was a comment, not a question, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I have another question from Larry and Rosanna. Do you work on multiple paintings at a time? Yes, always. Uh, it, when you work in oil, <laughs> if you work on one at a time, you're going to be waiting forever. So um, I always work on multiple paintings at a time. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Yes, I would like to, this is Rosanna, I would like to ask about the cypress knees. They're pieces of wood, am I understanding correctly? And do they shrivel? What do you do to treat them to increase the, their longevity once you create pieces out of them? I, um, well, what I, I did a, um, uh, trying to think of the mediums that I used underneath before I put the acrylic on, um, and I, it, I, it's not, I'm not remembering it, but I, I did read what I should put on first to treat the wood, and then I put acrylic over that, and then I also did another medium on top of the acrylic. Uh, so there was something I used, and not, I'm sorry that I can't think what it was because I did that. Um, you know, in 2019, and so much has happened since then. <laughs> I just don't remember the, and I, I haven't used it since I used that. But I, I could find out and, and tell Jean, and then you can maybe get, tell, or, or you can send me an email and remind me or something. Yeah, yeah, sure. I would be happy to trade emails with you guys so you can let them know a little bit more about the process. Okay. Um, so I have another question in the chat. This one's from Martha. Do you have a favorite painting and or sculpture in this series? Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's like with children, it's hard to say what a favorite, you know, child is. I mean, cause your paintings or your art is like your, your children, they come from you. Um, I, I, I real I like in the sculpture, I like the elegance of the, um, Soulmates, I do like that. Um, and I, boy, I'm trying to think uh, on the others. Uh, I probably have two favorites in the um, in the paintings. I had the one being the um, weathering the storm, the, the one that was on cold wax and um, uh, on board. And um, the other one called Free Spirits, because um, the, those to me capture something that I, I don't even know how I, sometimes when you're done with the painting, I'm sure any, any artist in this um, talk will, you don't even know how you got there. And that's, uh, you know, like I don't know how I got to some of the places. and. In, uh, in these and free spirits that that background those mountains and the same thing with the background in the 
weathering the storm. Thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, Chris, regarding the number of beings that you include in your painting. So I counted, I think, as high as like 16 in the night painting, and then maybe as few as like four. And can do you make a conscious decision? Okay, I want many beings in this one, a few in the other one. Um. No, not really, because it all depends on what works as I'm doing. I, I, I don't consciously, it, uh, I feel a painting, I don't think a painting. So as I'm working on it, if I, I feel that this, I need more here, then it's, it's the feeling that I have or what, it's spontaneous. It's not, it's not thought. I, I think, what, I'll tell you what, the last one, where there are the, the four really big ones with the red, you know, in the background, that started out with three, and I knew I wanted them to be really large, so I could only put so many in there, and, but I wanted a fourth one for some reason, and so I squeezed it in there, but, you know, so I don't know. Thank you. And um, another question I have for you is that you were speaking about when you were traveling and how the, the discovery was made looking at the stone walls. Do you photograph the stone walls? Do you sketch them, take notes um, to then remember to create something? I, I photograph them so that I can, you know, remember them but, you know, the thing is, is that there's so many times where you just, you know, those types of things are a jumping off point for me that just, you know, it's not like I'm trying to copy what I see. It's more like it's it catapults me into something else. And um, so, you know, like how we all need something when we're creating that um, starts us that, you know gets us started and uh, so yeah thank you what do you plan on working on next i've already moved through two other series since then i i did uh, a series of of uh non-objective abstracts during the lockdown that i call energy force and it was based on the um thought of where does all the energy go that's leaving the earth, you know, with all these souls leaving the earth. And um, so I, I did a lot of that. And, uh, and then um, I've started on another series just not too long ago. And it has, a more, it's a more upbeat feeling, but what I, it is, is that when I, I do background, I do a background that it, it takes into consideration whatever I want to throw in that background. And then how I finish the painting is how I'm feeling that day. When I finish, when I, when I go down to put my marks on it, it's either I'm feeling calm or I'm feeling confused or chaotic or whatever. And so I'm, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm uh, journaling my feelings onto um, the canvas. Okay, thank you. I, I have another comment. Chris, you did such a marvelous job explaining it seriously that it leaves very few questions about your process and why and all of that. But, but what it does to me is it explains how life works, right? You go through disturbing times and then you kind of came to a calm conclusion or you left it unresolved because you couldn't process it yet. And then you move to another painting and that one sort of leaves you calmer and resolved, but it's on top of the darkness or the disturbingness, and then you resolve it with a warm and a calm. And it, it's almost like why those those three things you said were your favorite or my favorite, because they're they resolve, they calm, they got warm, and uh, the disturbing ones are disturbing to me. You know, they yes. really do. So. And there's so many complex layers. It's like a life. How do you explain a life? It's one layer upon another, you know, and it would take a lifetime to explain it. And since then you've been in a million other 
situation. So that's why you're never done. Right, right, exactly. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. I have a, a comment from Larry and Rosanna. They say they love your paintings. Um, Lisa uh, has a question for you. Will you go back to this series and create more of them or do you consider it completed? Um, well, Lisa, you as an artist know this more than anyone, I think. Uh, it's very hard to ever go back. I mean, you're never in the same. Um, and if you try to do it, it, it doesn't work. So um, I don't think so. I, I feel like it's completed. And I feel um, I don't think I would, you know, have the same feeling that I had. I mean, I think what we've all gone through in the past year, I mean, everything has changed so much. And, um, you know, that was done in a certain that, that was done in 2019 before, you know, all of this craziness happened. And, um, you know, and before, before I even did that series, the spiritual journey series, you know, I was doing abstract landscapes. And, um, and I couldn't do a landscape now if you paid me to do it. I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm on to doing very non-objective things right now. So I guess, you know, I, I think they're done. I think the people are done. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Chris? Got a thumbs up from Lisa, awesome. Okay, so I think what we will do, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you everybody for creating a lovely conversation just now. So I am going to introduce our next speaker in a moment. I'm going to actually make her a co-host if I find her in my chat right here. Here we go, co-host, okay, perfect. All right, there we go, perfect, okay. Our next speaker is Adele Kubel. Adele Kubel grew up in Cheltenham and has lived in the Abington area her whole life. She did both her undergraduate and graduate work at Tyler School of Art. Presently, she teaches art in the city of Philadelphia. She has been an art teacher for almost 33 years. I have a quote here from Adele. She says, my paintings are about my love for luscious, rich surfaces and arrangements. My paintings are about the physical and the spiritual. My paintings are compulsive and obsessive. Please help me give a warm welcome to Adele Kubel. Oh, Adele, you're muted. <laughs> We'll get you going there. All right, you hear me now? Yes, I got you. Right. So involved with how do I get this on and how do I do that? First <laughs> of all, I really like listening to you, Chris. It was really amazing. <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and I wasn't sure, uh, you know, it's always hard to listen to people, but you do a very organized, clearly presented presentation and your quotes are beautiful. Um, well, I'm gonna start off by not showing myself. I'd rather just show my work. And I will bring myself out certainly soon, but right now I'm gonna start with just my work. This is um, kind of my typical piece. So I wanted to show you this one first. I'm very um, obsessive and compulsive when I'm working. And um, I do a lot of layering as you do, and my pieces are very small. This one can fit in the palm of your hand. Um, you're looking at it big, but it's really very small. And I do a lot of building up. And sometimes when I come back the next day, I will take everything off the painting and start over again. Um, so to say how far I go with the surface, it's hard to say, but I do know the edges are very important to me. I kind of turn them into objects in your, that you can hold in your hand. And getting close to my work is very important to me too, because I tend to look at things very closely. Um, I like organic things, um, nothing with hard edges. Uh, the layering is important. Um, there's a, like a love I have for rich surfaces. And I do spend a lot of time, no matter how simple the object I'm doing is, or how it seems not very complex, I spend a lot of time with the arrangement, how much green is gonna show here and how much um, red. Um, and the gooey thickness of it is extremely important to me when I'm building up the texture. 
Now, um, as small as my paintings are now, I started off as a very large painter. Um, but as soon as I got, I left college, I immediately went to smaller work. And the reason for that, I think, is it was, I put some thought into it. I didn't have the time I did in college. So I felt I couldn't control a large surface as much. So I went to smaller surfaces that allowed me more control. And I've been working um, outside of school for the past 30 some years. I've always worked on smaller surfaces, but in college for those four years, it was very large. And the first painters that I really loved a lot, they were portrait painters or self, they did self portraits or they were portrait painters or a little bit of both. Um, and I think that my love for them at the time I thought it was involved with just looking at people and the psychology and trying to figure people out. But, um, and I started as a portrait painter too, I think for the most part, but I found people very complicated. And what I really, I think loved about the painters that I first loved was that um, they were working with paint and building up surfaces as well and were obsessive about what they did. So I moved away from some of the painters that I first loved. Like I love Modigliani, but it was the surface I think that really attracted me to him. I was really into Alice Neal, who's a Philadelphia artist. But again, I think it was the surface, the way the pain hits the canvas that was really what appealed to me. And I thought it was, no, no, it's portraiture. Um, but then I, got involved with more of the abstract expressionists. I loved um, Jackson Pollock a lot. I still love Jackson Pollock a lot. Mark Rothko, I loved a lot. It was his color. Um, and the artists that I used to love, I still love, but I think I have a better understanding of why I like them. And I don't look now that I've been painting a bit of time to other artists as much. Like I can be pretty much somebody who works um, alone and I don't necessarily have to be motivated by other people's work the way I once was. Um, I know what's important to me and I know what I'm looking for a lot, but again, I don't, I never stop finding it. I find it in one painting, but it's not enough. I've got to find more of what I love in the other painting and that's what makes me want to paint again. I might've captured something, but I didn't get enough of it and it's almost like a drug. You do one painting and you feel compelled to do the next one. Um, and I, I'm not really an analytical person, but I am very emotional and I can go on and on with my emotions. And I think it allows me when I'm painting um, to put them somewhere, okay? And it makes me feel, a lot of it is what painting does for me. When I paint, I feel I have a release and I have the control of at least the small area. And um, that's important to me. And I have it in the palm of my hand or I have it on my lap, but I don't feel sometimes in life you have that much control. But when you're doing your art, you control that one area and you can really analyze it, think about it. And what I look for the most of all, of all is that surface. The touch of the surface is very important. Um, what do I paint with? I usually start with brushes, but I don't really just paint with brushes. I use my fingers a lot as well. I'm very physical with this small space. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, I feel like, you know, it's a little bit of, there's a lot of paint underneath that's important for me to get, but usually I'm not sure what I'm looking for, but I know when I've gotten it for that little moment, um, these are um, three flowers. And this is not one of my favorite paintings. I think I started off with one I prefer, but um, it does have a bit of the edges that I look for that's very important to me, but it's very distant and I prefer to get very close. And I think the other painting has more of the close up look that I, um, I'm as obsessive about getting close. I'm never close enough to what I need to see kind of thing. Um, this is a vacation painting and I love large open spaces, which I think appeals to just about everybody. Love 
the freedom of a large open space and looking out on the horizon that never ends. And it also allows me to build up the surfaces that I like. But when I painted it, I didn't realize that, but I love the way you can play with the ocean and really get those waves built up and the distance. The horizon line is very important too. Um, and you know, the small painting allows you to take the energy you have and get really obsessive with that little space. Now, this is also, of course, a small painting. All my paintings are small. I think it's six by eight inches or so. Here's another one from a vac it's vacations. Um, I love water. Everyone, you know, I think enjoys the ocean in some way. If it's not getting in the water, it's watching the water. And I absolutely love water. And I love the freedom of water. And I love the feeling of freedom that you get when you're in control or you think you're in control as well. Rainbows, rainbows. Um, my niece, when she was little, she loved drawing rainbows. And I saw that she loved rainbows and it was something that I started to get more involved in because whenever she would take out a piece of paper, she was drawing rainbows again. <laughs> and um, a lot of children that I work with at school also love rainbows too. And especially, you know, they're now the unicorns and the rainbows are very popular. And for a while, I took the idea that I really recognized in her because she was doing it in front of me all the time. She always had a new rainbow going with different lines in different directions and she didn't pay attention to, is this the correct color of a rainbow or what goes first or any of that. And I started to use that as well because again, it allows me to really build up the surfaces that I like a lot, um, develop the edges and make an object that's important to me. This one's a little bigger. It's like 12 inches by something a little less than that. But all my paintings again are very, very small. And um, I love the fact that with rainbows, I can do what I want, which is build up the surface. I love the fact that rainbows are uh, something a, a lot of girls appreciate and really get into and are joyous and celebrate. And I think um, with my paintings, at least the um, things that I start to work with, the image that I will start to work with is usually beautiful. I'm not one to say, well, I'm gonna start with something that's ugly. I usually start with what is beautiful and celebrate it from there, what's inside me and how I feel about it to some degree. Donuts. I love donuts <laughs> and I love icing. So these are my donuts. Um, I absolutely love donuts. I don't think I would feel like painting donuts mm, right now, but it, for a little bit of time, I thought, you know, that um, I would love to be a cake decorator. I would, <laughs> and this is my exploration of uh, icing, I guess. And um, I usually start my day off with coffee and there's nothing wrong with those donuts, especially when they're brand new and they put them out in Dunkin' Donuts. I just love donuts. <laughs> and um, so I think that's a celebration of donuts, but it also again, it allows me to explore like just my love for surfaces, my love for paint. I love paint. This is a different rainbow. Um, I do tend to go back to, oh, certain flowers more than other flowers, certain types of flowers that I like. I love the lily a lot. Um, and with the rainbow, I can go, I can go back to it again and again. I sort of made it a, maybe a little bit of my repertoire. Um, I don't think the donuts are part of my repertoire, but you never know. But rainbows to some degree are staying with me right now. And I love the fact that you can, I can, I feel, um, I love getting in there with the, like a little bit of a knife or the end of the brush and making a line across the rainbow, almost like a scar in a way, and then separating the colors, building up from there. Again, um, 
My niece was very good. Why does a rainbow have to be an arch? She began, rainbows going in all directions and all different places. These remind me of, uh, now that I'm looking at it, like tire marks on the street, <laughs> which aren't too beautiful. But um, I would like, you know, the bright color of the red next to the orange. I love red next to orange. I think I'm into purple and blue a lot. And the edging is important to me too. All my paintings are on masonite. They're oil on masonite and I don't put anything in my paint. It's just a buildup of paint. I'm very simple and straightforward. If something has more than two or three steps, I'm done with it. Um, here's some more donuts. Chocolate with sprinkles. And if, right now, I think what appeals to me most is the edge because I do start off with straight edges, but the paint really goes off the edge to the circle there. And sometimes I take, like I said, all the paint off and start over the next day. Um, sometimes I keep building up. I do though tend to work on one painting at a time, but I think that has to do with, I don't have, I don't have a lot of time sometimes. So I have less energy than I would like to have, but I'm planning maybe to, you know, leave my job soon and have more time to work. And I might try working because I think that would help me a lot. Like you were talking about Chris working on more than one painting at a time. I would, I think I would love to do that, but I tend to focus on just the one. I think I would get maybe some interesting things if I went further with dub with several paintings or just several paintings at one time and then one at the next time. Um, but I take the energy I have and I'm very focused with it, which is part of my obsess obsessive quality. This is the final one. I knew when I get to the final one because um, it's the fall leaf. And this is my favorite part of fall. I would say I still like this part of fall. Um, when the leaves fall from the trees and are still under the trees and they're still very beautiful and you see all the color, especially on a day like today and everything lights up with the sun, fall is beautiful. We usually by the time we get to Thanksgiving, my love is ended <laughs> and, I am, and the winter is starting to come. And unless um, I find the day by day stuff a little bit more difficult. I usually do the best of my painting, I think in the spring, the summer and the early part of the fall because this later part comes after Thanksgiving and the days get very, very short. It's harder for me, but this is like a perfect fall leaf with the scar going through it. And um, I happen to really uh, like this painting a lot. Right? <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones. And I'm trying to um, think of some other things to say, but I think I'm gonna stop the share and here I am. And Okay, thank you so much, Adele. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Adele on her process or the work in the show or any of the things she talked about today? I'm going to. Okay. I, I, um, oh, I have, okay. I, um, Larry, Larry and Rosanna have got one in the chat here. Um, can you talk about photographing your work? I don't photograph my work. Um, <laughs> I don't work from photographs for the most part, maybe for vacation, I do a little bit. I might have it up somewhere on a wall, maybe a photograph, but I quickly don't need the photograph. Um, if I start flowers, I will go get some flowers. I'll have them nearby. Um, and they'll start to wilt and I'll look at them less and less, but I usually do like to have flowers nearby if I'm working with a flower. With my niece, when I started her rainbow paintings, um, I got a couple from her and I had them on the wall and then I did my own versions. Um, I do start like I have something that I'm starting with, a very physical thing maybe in front of me, like a photograph to some degree, but I don't need it very quickly. Okay. 
Um, my guess is that you. they were talking about um, like photographing your work once it's completed, because I, I too noticed since your work has those beautiful edges, you can't really do the thing that artists typically do is you just kind of crop them in. Is that just something that you have somebody else do or do you do that yourself? I don't take my own photographs. Um, yeah, I usually have somebody else take photographs if I'm looking for photographs of the work. I don't feel I'm that good a photographer to take it for some people are experts at, you know, photographing art. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Joanne. She's asking, how long does it take for a painting to dry? Oh, it can take, it takes years. I don't think they're probably totally dry <laughs> underneath. Um, it takes a long time for oil painting to dry, um, years. They're very thick. For small paintings, they can be very heavy. I have a question from Larry. He's saying, how do you mount the paintings? You went right to a mask suddenly. <laughs> How do I mount the paintings? Um, sometimes I'm not that great with, I don't feel the need to have a frame around them. I will tell you that I'm fine with just putting them, leaning them against the wall, which is kind of popular now with, with um, you see with home design, they just lean it against the wall or a shelf or something. I don't feel the need to frame, but if someone else wanted to, I'd be fine with it, but it's not my thing. Okay, thank you. Um... I've got another question from Katya, I think it is. Adele, your work is beautiful. How do you do, how much do your paintings weigh? Uh, probably pretty light since they're very small. How long do you typically work on a painting? Um, they're heavy, but they're small. They are heavy though. You have to pick, uh, some of them are very heavy because paint weighs a lot. And it, I don't keep track of how long I typically work on a painting. I work on it until I feel like um, I got the surface the way I want for the most part, I think, and then I'm done. All right. Um, sorry about that. We've got another show coming up. <laughs> really like, quickly. You're getting things <laughs> going. <laughs> Okay, um, I was wondering, um, I actually had a question for you, Adele. So since I always am curious um, with painters like you who paint extremely thick and you have this huge buildup of layers, does your painting go through, do you initially know what the color and the value of your painting is gonna look like or does that change a lot through these layers? I don't, yeah, I don't know what anything's going to look at like. I do know if I'm, I've started with a flower, I end up with some kind of flower. Um, I started with, I want a landscape, I end up with it. But I don't put a lot of um, excessive thought and I work as I go and that's it. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Gotcha. That's funny, it seems like you and Chris have that in common, is you kind of like have kind of an idea, but you're more about feeling and reacting to where the painting is gonna go. Okay, um, great, thank you. I have one from Adam. Um, what is one of your favorite things to paint? Oh, that's my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> I paint in rainbows. It's a flowers. I like, you know, that's enough, Adam. <laughs> I have enough. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. Um, flowers, rainbows. It seems like you get like inspiration from um, it's almost like your family or young people because you have this theme I of feel like kids a lot. Yes. I love kids. Yeah. I love looking at their art. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Um, I've got a couple coming up in the chat. I've got one from Joanne. What do you do with the paint you scrape off? I just leave it on the, I usually use something like um, a tray from a cafeteria as a surface, as a palette. And I just start building it up and that's it. I have a very heavy tray. I can have a tray of paint that you can't carry out the door. I've, I have had, there's 60, 70, 80 pounds. I build up the paint a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another one from Larry and Rosanna. Do you use nail polish on some of, don't you use nail polish on some of your works? I believe um, the that drawings. has to do, the drawings, yeah. yes. I didn't talk about the drawings and I didn't show any of the drawings there. Um, 
I do use nail polish on my paint, on my drawings, um, you can get like a painted surface with nail polish. And nail polish is beautiful. So I love to paint with nail polish. And I'm not that attuned to smell. So I keep the doors and windows open and it really doesn't bother me the smell of nail polish, which you would think it would. But I just love the colors it comes in and it's beautiful too, but I don't put it in paint. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Any more questions for Adele about her work or anything like that? Okay, well, I want to thank both of our uh, speakers, both Chris and Adele, for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, so um, I just before I'm going to do some plugs for the art center real quick before we head out. Um, uh, we have a new upcoming show that's going to be up after Thanksgiving. It's our annual jury show with juror Michael Gallagher. If you did enjoy this coffee break and you want to see more events from us, you can always donate to Abington Art Center by going to abingtonartcenter.org slash donations. And lastly, if for whatever reason you missed this talk or you missed part of it or you want to share it with your friends, this talk will be uploaded to YouTube later. So once again, thank you to our speakers and thank you all for joining us. Have a great and lovely weekend. You too.